The Core Worlds were the heart of civilization in the Star Wars galaxy. It was the human-dominated worlds of the Core that founded the Republic 25,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, and thus, as the Republic grew to stretch across the whole galaxy, the power and influence of the Core grew with it. During times of war, the Core Worlds were always kept safe, defended heavily by the best of the Republic Navy. But sometimes, the Republic's enemies were able to take the fight to the Core Worlds regardless, something that happened multiple times during the Clone Wars. The Confederacy of Independent Systems launched several campaigns in the Core Worlds, and in this video, we're going to be discussing one of the most devastating such campaigns, the Bulwark Fleet Rampage. Attention, Sergeant on deck! When the Clone Wars began, the Core Worlds were divided between six sector armies. Of them, the first sector army, as your hammer command, had the most important job. Sector 1 was the very heart of the Republic, containing Coruscant, Asakan, and Axis, and many more of the Republic's most crucial worlds. It was imperative that the Confederacy be kept out of Sector 1 for obvious reasons. The loss of any number of Sector 1 worlds would be a serious blow to the Republic, and any foothold the Seps got in the region would become a beachhead they would surely use to attack Coruscant itself. At the start of the war, there were a few separatist systems in Sector 1. Of them, Scipio feigned neutrality and was closely monitored by the Republic Navy, while the Skako system and surrounding Techno Union worlds were quarantined. But the Republic's biggest concern was Forost. Once, Forost had been the Republic Navy's greatest shipyard world, an ancient industrial colony located just a quick hyperspace jump coreward of Coruscant. During the Sith Wars, the Forost shipyards had churned out some of the greatest ships in the Republic Navy, and their exclusive contract with the military made Forost very wealthy. But after the end of the new Sith Wars, the Republic military was disbanded and Forost began to fade. It tried to become a power player in the private sector, but Kuat and Rendili outcompeted it. As a result, the Techno Union was able to purchase the Forost shipyards a few centuries before the Clone Wars. Forost was still loyal to the Techno Union when the Clone Wars broke out, and unlike a number of other Techno Union affiliates in the core, Forost refused to break ties with the mega corporation and seceded instead. This was a major problem for the Republic. It was bad enough that the CIS had one of the most foremost shipyard worlds in the galaxy, but Forost was right in Coruscant's backyard, way too close for comfort. The Republic responded to Forost's secession in the only way it really could, by blockading the planet and its orbital shipyards. At the time, the Republic didn't have the manpower to spare to invade and capture the planet, and it would be a waste of scarce resources to attempt it. Thus, they besieged the planet instead, hoping that isolation would cause Forost's shipyards to atrophy, neutralizing the threat posed by the world. For a while, it seemed like this was the right call. The Forost siege went on for a full two years without incident. It seemed like the Confederacy had abandoned the planet. But unfortunately for the Republic, things weren't as they seemed. When the Forost siege began, one of the Confederacy's greatest naval officers happened to have been visiting the shipyards at the time an old Celestian Admiral named Dua Ningo. Ningo wasn't keen to sit out the war, and so he began working with the Techno Union engineers at Forost to find a way to break the siege. Forost was far from any other Separatist worlds, and on the other side of the Republic's greatest strongholds, so they couldn't really count on reinforcements, but that ultimately didn't matter. They still had the Forost shipyards, plenty of on-site resources, and an army of some of the Techno Union's best engineers. These engineers ended up designing the Bulwark-class battlecruiser Mark I. These kilometer-long vessels were armed to the teeth with turbo lasers, ion cannons, and point defense laser cannons, and they were so heavily armored, they could ram lesser vehicles head-on without fear of taking damage. In total secrecy, the Forost shipyards produced a fleet full of them. When this bulwark fleet was completed in 20 BBY, Admiral Ningo assumed command of it, taking the battlecruiser Unrepentant as his flagship. Midway through 20 BBY, with the Republic still recovering from Operation Dirge's Lance, General Grievous' assault on the Southern Corps, Ningo set out to break the Forost siege. 
Without warning, the Bulwark fleet attacked the Forest blockade and Republic forces were absolutely massacred. Ningo's warships plowed right through the blockade's smaller vessels and shredded the Republic's Venator-class Star Destroyers with their superior turbo laser arrays. The Republic didn't stand a chance. As Captain Jan Dodner watched the Bulwark fleet slaughter his ships, all he could do was prevent Ningo from jumping straight to Coruscant. In that, at least, he was successful. Ningo jumped Corward instead of Rimward, heading away from the galactic capital. Of course, that wasn't enough to keep Ningo away from Coruscant. After two years of sitting around Forost, he was determined to take the galactic capital, even if he wouldn't be able to attack it right out of the gate. He directed the Bulwark fleet to make for Ixtla, a mercantile city planet just down the Krillian run from Coruscant, which he hoped to claim as a beachhead. The Republic had a massive threat on its hands. Ningo was just a stone's throw away from Coruscant, and the Bulwark fleet seemed unstoppable. But like before, things weren't as they seemed. For months, the Republic had actually been working on its own new warships. In a joint project, Rendili Star Drive and Kuat Drive Yards were designing a new line of Star Destroyers, which the Navy hoped would turn the tide of the war, the Victory Class. These new Star Destroyers were slightly smaller than the older Venator class and didn't carry nearly as much Starfighters, but they packed far more punch. With 10 heavy quad turbo lasers, 40 dual turbo laser batteries, and 80 concussion missile tubes, the Victory class Star Destroyer was exactly the sort of heavy hitting warship the Republic desperately needed. When news of the Battle of Furrost broke, the first of these Star Destroyers were immediately deployed, six months before they had been scheduled to. The first wave of them was grouped up into the Victory Fleet, which was placed under the joint command of two distinguished captains, Jan Dodner, who had commanded the Furrost Siege, and Terranald Screed. Screed and Dodna met Ningo at Ixtla, sparking a ferocious naval battle. Both the Bulwark and the Victory Fleet fought hard, but in the end, neither was able to overcome the other. The battle ended in a draw, as the Bulwark fleet fled to try another vector. Hoping to slip past the Victory Fleet, Ningo next attacked Alsakan, another of Coruscant's neighbours, and incidentally, the very first system to try seceding from the Republic 17,000 years prior. But Screed and Dodna caught up with the Bulwark fleet and fought them to a draw above Alsakan once more. After this, Ningo retreated to Basilisk, hoping to regroup and reconsider his strategy above that long dead rock of a world. But the Victory fleet pursued him again and fought him to a draw there as well. Neither side was getting anywhere, and so Dodna and Screed came up with a plan to beat Ningo for good. At Basilisk, as Ningo started to retreat, Dodna took half of the Victory Fleet and headed for Anaxis, the headquarters of the Republic Navy. Enraged at his failure to attack Coruscant, Ningo pursued him, knowing that the Bulwark Fleet was capable of destroying Dodna's task force alone. The two fleets met once more in Anaxis's upper atmosphere, where Ningo had the advantage. The Bulwark Fleet pummeled Dodna's ships into slag one by one sending their burning wrecks crashing to the planet below. This was not a battle Dodna could win, but he wasn't trying to win. He was just trying to hold position and keep Ningo occupied. The old Celestin learned why when Screed jumped out of hyperspace with the rest of the Victory fleet, emerging right on top of the Bulwark fleet. Ningo was caught in a battle on two fronts, and this time there was no chance of escape for him or his fleet. The surviving Star Destroyers pounded away at the Bulwark ships, and Screed ordered his flagship, the Arleone, to get as close as it could to Ningo's flagship. The Arleone and the Unrepentant tore into each other at point-blank range. Both ships suffered severe damage, and Screed himself was badly wounded. But the Arleone was fresh to the battle, while the Unrepentant had already taken damage, and Screed ultimately triumphed. The Unrepentant was vaporized and Duaningo was killed in the blast. In short order, the rest of the Bulwark fleet was destroyed as well, and the Victory fleet was, well, victorious. This Battle of Anaxis was the smaller of two battles fought over the Defender of the Core, but it was one the Republic ultimately publicized more due to the wild success of the Victory fleet. Against all odds, Screed and Dodna had single-handedly saved the heart of the Republic from annihilation. 
The injuries Screed had suffered in the battle were severe, but Cybernetics saved his life and he eventually made a full recovery. He and Dodna were commemorated for their accomplishments three weeks after the battle in a highly publicized ceremony at the Anaxus Citadel. Both of them would go on to be important figures during the Galactic Civil War. Screed became one of the Empire's foremost admirals, while Dodna became a general in the Rebel Alliance and planned the attack on the first Death Star. So that was the story of the Bulwark Fleet Rampage, the Separatist campaign that nearly brought the Republic to its knees. But what do you think? Would you like to hear more about campaigns like this in the future? Let us know which ones you'd like to hear in the comment section below. And just before you run off to the suggested videos guys, make sure you check out our new channel called The Braved, where we dive deep into history and go through all different eras to find some of the most badass individuals and tell their stories in a high quality format there. We post weekly, so make sure you check it out. And if you're just more into music, check out our Relax Shack music channel, where we take the music there and chuck them on the videos here. And if you just want to get access to a behind the scenes discord where you can chat to myself and the entire team there, and get access to exclusive content, then consider donating to the Patreon. And if you just want to join our wider community, check us out on our main Geatsleys Discord where you can chat to myself and other Star Wars fans, and our Geatsleys Gaming Network, which is almost done guys, so get hyped for an epic Clone Wars Garry's Mod server. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.